welcome to everybody who is joining us on, on Facebook. Uh, and today is All Souls Day. And what I promised was that we would uh, basically be concentrating something on the um, uh, our Catholic Christian. Um, Father John will chime in with a few Anglican insights um, <laughs> of of just how we handle uh, how we handle death, the 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 reality of death, which. Let's face it, is something that A, we all want to run away from, and we tend to, in practice, if not in theory, deny. And, uh, and yet our uh, mental, emotional, and spiritual health so much depends on our uh, discovering ways to integrate and even to embrace our mortality into the way that we live our lives. So I'd like to explore that a little bit in our Catholic liturgical tradition, as well as in our, uh, in our Catholic tradition of, of how we interpret scripture, how we understand the realities of our, of, of our lives, of our world, and, and the promises of God in that were made in Jesus Christ, which you know, for a Christian, that's got to be at the center, doesn't it? So, how we do that, that's kind of what I'd like to talk about a little today. Let me introduce who our members of our coffee team are today. Uh, welcome back to Father John Crean, who has uh, uh, finally returned home from wandering. Uh, all over the place. Well, at least up to Oregon, right? Yes. Yeah. To yeah. see our family. And and Jan Pass, who is uh, sitting in her home, but with a background at at Holy Name Church, uh, Holy Name of Mary, and uh, Kathy Creighton who has a living background of mm -hmm. flowers on a trellis. Very beautiful. So Very it is beautiful. lovely. And I've got my background of artificial flowers too. You've noticed they haven't, they haven't changed a bit in all the time that, that we've been on. They never will, Tom, they, they never, never will. Well, I, I have to dust them <laughs> occasionally. We have to tell Cardinal Wilton about that. And my uh, Turkish cup, of course. Turkey that's, Tuesday. That's very one. good. And you would use that also on Thanksgiving, I guess, right? I could, but it's really not very gracious to drink red wine out of uh, <laughs> out of a cup. But it's a turkey cup. Right. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about it. I couldn't resist. Yeah, I know. I know. It's a, it's, it's a great pun. So as we begin, we have six people now uh, joining us on Facebook Live. So welcome again to all of you. Um, and let's begin with a prayer. And uh, I'm once again going to use the, uh, the prayer of today from uh, the Plow website, the website of the Bruderhof uh, communities uh, in the United States and in Europe. Uh, the, uh, if you haven't been there, I do recommend um, checking out their website and checking out their publication, which is called, of course, Plow. It's, uh, it, uh, to my mind, they are a group of people who have kind of gotten spirituality right uh, the way of integrating uh, the uh, way of life taught and exemplified by Jesus in our, in our world today. That certainly is one form of witness. Anyway, check them out. Plow.com. I, I think it's .com, not .org. P-L-O-U-G-H. Uh, anyway, let's go to the prayer. Kathy also has a prayer intention 
that she would like to share with us. Do you want me to do that now? Please. Yes, I just offer up prayers for my brother who has has fallen into some more trouble. He's had troubles throughout his adult life. And uh, I just pray for for him, his his soul, for justice, for the people that have been involved in, in, in a hit and run. And I just pray that God is with him and with all of those involved. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, and let us also, thank you. And mm -hmm. our hearts are with your brother, Marvin, mm -hmm. uh, you. at, at this time. And also, uh, uh, this being All Souls Day, let's bring to mind the, um, the people in our own lives who have died over the past uh, year, whom we commend to the Lord, and, and also those who are struggling with their own mortality and and possibly facing death in the near future, that we may be with them in their need and to trust confidently in the fulfillment of the Lord's promises. So at any rate, here is the text of the prayer. So uh, if you'd like to uh, I'll, I'll read the scripture and then we can pray together if you wish. Uh, since then, you have been raised with Christ. This is from the letter of the, to the Colossians. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Let us pray. Lord, our God, we thank you for sending into our lives so much that turns our thoughts to things above and enables us always to look to you. Through Jesus Christ, send us what is of heaven. Send us, send what is of heaven into every single life and into the lives of nations so that something good may arise and the glory does not go to the devil, but to your spirit, your heavenly spirit alone. In their stubbornness, people intend to do evil, but you can turn it all to the good. You change everything. This is our faith. We hope in you, and we want to put our lives in your hands. Bless us with heavenly riches and power Amen. Amen. Uh, focusing our lives on the centrality of Jesus Christ and the promise of fulfillment in what we traditionally called the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is not just that we get to heaven after we die, but rather that we participate in the fullness of what God intends for us, that we are striving for that now by the way that we live, uh, by the way that we strive to integrate uh, the reality of God into our lives and the way that we approach our world. And, and, you know, Jesus has made it very, very clear that we do that by treating others, by loving others as we are loved by him. Uh, you know, the, the, the new commandment of Jesus is not love your neighbor as yourself. The new commandment of Jesus is to love one another as I love you. And our Christian tradition has always struggled with that question of who is my neighbor. That's not just something that a Jewish scribe asked. Uh, that's something that we continue to ask because we tend to constantly draw lines uh, between those who are our neighbor and those whom we consider not to be our neighbor, therefore we don't have to love them. 
uh, or try to figure out ways to love them. What I'd like to do today is launch in a re hopefully relatively brief description of the tradition of our Catholic funeral liturgy as embodied in the Vatican II reforms. Because most people prior to Vatican II and still, you know, often see the uh, the, the, the services that the church provides upon the death of a uh, Catholic, upon the death of a Christian, as, uh, as, as, as being kind of a jumbled mess. You know, we, we, we have a rosary uh, the night before, and then we have a mass, and then we have the burial, but the cemetery service, we go to the cemetery for a service. And then what often happens in practice, uh, not always, but often happens in practice is that we don't actually witness the burial of the person. Uh, but that we, uh, uh, cemeteries in some cemeteries, Catholic cemeteries in particular, you know, encourage everybody to leave with the coffin still sitting on its uh stand above the open grave, which is carefully disguised by artificial grass. And uh, there is something actually incomplete about that. And uh, if we look at the rite of, or the order of Christian funerals, which is the name of the, the liturgical book, uh, you know, it, it calls for the actual burial to be part of that concluding rite. So I'd just like to walk through what ideally we do. Obviously, there are many circumstances and many reasons why we do something different and try to discover within that what is the, the, the best uh, way of handling uh, our funeral, but see what that see what this has to say to us. First of all, uh, one of the reforms called for by Second Vatican Council, which we haven't integrated very well, is that the anointing of the sick should not any longer be called last rites. That the sacrament of anointing of the sick is bringing the presence of the church's prayer and the power of God through Christ to be present through this sacrament, the sign of anointing, to the person who is suffering some sort of illness. Maybe terminal, maybe not, but the church needs to be there in prayer and, and supporting and helping. Now, that can't be a substitute for the actual personal presence of uh, somebody holding the person's hand and, and showing loving care and attention. That is very, very necessary. But the sacrament of anointing should be a sign of that. And I'm not going to get too much into that, except that anointing itself is not, quote, the last rites. Mm. What is the last rite? The last rite is what is called viaticum which is something that nobody has ever heard of, even in the 50, 60 years since the Vatican Council. But viaticum is, a, uh, is the Eucharist, the last Eucharist that is celebrated with the person who is dying. What's necessary for viaticum is that the person recognizes that they are dying and this is part of their preparation for death. So uh, the reception of the Eucharist, reception of communion, which is not just a sign of Jesus' presence or the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, which we affirm. Uh, it's not merely a symbol, uh, an empty symbol, I would, I would say, but it is a full symbol. It is, it is the fullness of his presence of his presence with us. But 
in him is his whole body, the body of the church, the communion of saints. So uh, the entirety of, of the faithful are joined together in that Eucharist, that reception of communion by the, uh, by the dying person uh, who are with that person, who are cheering that person along. Um, I think it's a good way of recognizing all saints as being all of those who are in the presence of God in eternity, cheering us along uh, as we, uh, that, that's a meaning of intercession, I think, that they are with us, cheering us along as we are continuing the journey that they have fulfilled, the pilgrimage. They have come to the goal of the pilgrimage. We are still on the pilgrimage. So they're cheering us along. Uh, all souls is the flip side of that coin. We as those who are still on pilgrimage, on this pilgrimage of this life, through our prayer and inter intercession, are cheering along those who have died but have not yet opened themselves to receiving the fullness of God's presence, whatever that might mean. Uh, but that's kind of what we mean by purgatory, that those who are, it's not a place, it's not even a length of time, as often we have tended to consider it, but it is a, a, a process. We all know, we all know very well that um, even at the time of our death, there is a lot that is clinging to us that is not of God, that we are still struggling with. The struggle, perhaps, of the last moment of life, perhaps, uh, or as we step into eternity, the struggle to let go of what pulls us, tugs at us away from God to be able to embrace God as God wants to embrace us for eternity and bring us into the fullness of whatever God has in store for us. And we don't know the details of that. We know the fact of it, but we don't really know the details of it, except that it is union with God. So uh, we are in a sense on this day, All Souls Day, and throughout our lives too, uh, our prayer for those who have gone before us, and that is a long-standing tradition that perhaps the um, evangelicals, you know, have sort of cast out. They don't pray for the dead. They pray for the living, but they don't pray for the dead. We have always prayed for the dead, including graffiti that's found in the catacombs uh, 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 expresses Christian prayer for those who have gone before us. And uh, the, the biblical proof, Tom, for that is a lot of people don't know that, but it's from 2 Maccabees. I'm sure you know that. Yeah. It, is, it is a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead, that they may be loosed from their sins. Yeah. That's, the only, now, that's the only line that, that proves uh, uh, sort yeah. of a proof text for purgatory. Yeah, yeah. And, and I don't go too much for proof texts. Uh, I, know, you know, I, I know. I I I'd rather use them as a as a source for our further reflection. But I agree. The, there is a problem with that text, though. Is that right? V big problem. Evangelicals well, don't uh, evangelicals don't recognize Maccabees well, uh, as yes, canonical. It's a, yes, deuterocanonical book or it's apocrypha. The, yeah, the apocrypha. Which means you know it's not really the revealed word of God. Yeah. And the so-called so-called Protestant Bibles don't have the apocrypha. Right. So let's not get further into that. <laughs> yeah, right. that that is an indication that at least the late Jewish tradition there was there there was a movement to um, uh, to to commend the dead, to pray for the dead, commend them to the Lord. Right. I have uh, I have a couple of questions I want to get into, if I may, is I've, I've 
read all the stuff that you put out on, you know, uh, for the uh, preparation for today. And you alluded to the whole question of time, because there is the chronos time, the, the you know, clock time, you know, and, and so on, the stuff we have to watch on in our daily lives. But then there's also what's called kairos, which is defined as the eternal now. It's, it's, it's time without time. And once we pass from uh, this life into the next life, we're in chronos. We're no longer in kairos. Uh, we're in Kairos, we're no longer in Kronos, we're in the Lord's time. And my question is this, in terms of um, the, the what we used to call the holy souls, the poor souls, those who mm -hmm. passed on, the question is, do we pray to them or for them? Because we don't know whether they've already been admitted to heaven, because we're still bound by Kronos, we're still bound by mm -hmm. that clock time. And um, I find myself in my own spirituality of praying to uh, these people mm -hmm. I know of, of led you know exemplary lives um, some of my former bishops and, and priests and, and family that I'm sure are there and I consider them you know communio sanctorum they're in the communion of saints in my book and so they're they're basically November 1st people not November 2nd people if you will so I, I how does one deal with this particularly from the Catholic perspective about praying to or praying for uh, those are the, what we would call the faithful departed. Yeah. You know, what, what I see in that Catholic tradition is that there is nothing, there is no reason for us not to pray for their help and their intercession. Um, it doesn't seem to be a part of Catholic liturgical prayer you know, in, in, in the in the funeral rites, but you know, our our tradition is that that if you're going to consider purgatory in the sense of heaven or hell, that purgatory is actually an entryway to heaven. It's not a part of hell, even right. if our tradition has has uh, overlaid it with all kinds of. Um, uh, Dante penal, uh, penal concepts, you know, right. of, of, of punishment due to sin and all of that kind of stuff. They are still um, in union with God, anticipating the fullness of the union of God. And again, that has absolutely nothing to do with our sense of time, which is the chronos time. Uh, it, it has, so, you know, we can We, we just have to let go of our concepts of, 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 of time being a succession of events and basically say they are on the other side. They are in union with God, even if, uh, uh, well, they're, 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 not, they're not experiencing the succession of events as we do. Uh, and we don't understand that. You know, we can't really come to a full understanding of, of eternity. I, 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 you know, I, 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 I know the distinction between Kronos and, and uh, Kairos, yeah. but uh, I'm not too comfortable with, with applying Kairos to uh to eternity kairos to me has more often been like uh an event or an opportunity uh, that transcends the limitations of of time as we experience it but more you know more is like a graced moment um but uh, i don't want to get can i can i ask i'll see you there can Kathy. I yes so um I, I was always, I always thought that when we talked about the communion of saints, we were talking about the people in Kronos time, the people in purgatory, and the people in heaven. That was the communion of saints. So, yeah. I mean, I don't know if I, I'm, not, I'm sure I'm not saying anything different, but I'm just, you know, just in my own mind clarifying that that's what we mean when we talk about 
we're not just talking about the people, the communion of, the communion of, you know, the communion of saints is all of these, of yeah. all of us, basically. Right. You know, the ones who are living, the ones who are dead, the ones who are in heaven. Yeah. But one, one of the things that, that I think that we need to purify our own concepts of purgatory from is any sense of time in purgatory. Mm. And of course, uh, that's hard for us in the Catholic tradition because we've had this tradition, which I think has <laughs> I limitations yeah. of, uh, of gaining indulgences. Yeah. And we usually um, days. Yeah. see indulgences in terms of days. Right. You, know, uh, you say such and such a prayer and you get 100 days indulgence. Right. And, right. and we've often considered that as 100 days off of purgatory. <laughs> well, that's never what it meant. It always meant that this saying this prayer was the equivalent of a hundred days of penance. So I don't, if, if I say this prayer with the right disposition, I experience the same result as if I did a hundred days of, of penance, of fasting and, and constant praying and all of that. Well, there is a little something wrong with that logic. Um, uh, particularly when that logic applied to um, uh, fundraising to build St. Peter's. Oh, yeah. Which is what triggered, got Martin Luther all upset, among other things. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah, it's true. But, you know, I wonder, I've got a question for you, Tom, sort of the footnote to this, if I may. You know the Recolta, right? You know, the book mm -hmm. I'm talking about, which is the... Uh, it's a it's a compendium of, of, of all the Catholic prayers that are, you know, uh, considered legit. They still have attached to each one of those prayers the indulgences. I have a copy of that book. I just wonder is was that sort of revised after the council, or is that still in force? Well, you know, I I think Pope Paul the Sixth, now Saint Paul the Sixth. Um, uh, published a revision of the whole doctrine of indulgences, removing the uh, number of days and just making a distinction between partial and plenary. Okay. Which of course is a problematic thing too. You know, you gain a plenary indulgence, you go right to heaven. You can skip purgatory. Well, not necessarily because the conditions are not just that you have to uh, say certain prayers and uh, go to confession and receive communion, but the conditions also are that you have to have uh, 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 be sorry for your sins <laughs> and have uh, you know ha have purified yourself from from the sins, which uh, becomes in some ways very very subjective. Janice. You know, what I'm wondering is if all of these things were just organized in a way so that the us are on earth and for the people in the pews could simply understand it in a way that I know it had an order in such so that it could be understandable by the by the masses, so to speak. Well, I think I would suspect so. I, th I think you've got a... Um... A real point there. Uh, the the origins, however, are a little bit more problematic because you know the origins were really to try to get people to go on crusades. Yeah. Um, and you know what? It didn't make a bit of difference how big a sinner you were, what kind of terrible life you led, but if you went on crusade, all of your sins were forgiven, and if you died in the crusade, you'd go straight to heaven. And that was something that was that, that basically was preached, which unfortunately sounds a little bit like on the other side of the Crusades, um, Muslims often would preach that those who died killing infidels 
would go straight to heaven too. And uh, let's step aside from all of that yeah, right. for the moment. Uh, briefly, there are three parts to the Catholic funeral ritual, lit liturgy, the order of funerals. One, which we sort of used to simply say, well, we say the rosary the night before. The, uh, the Irish had it maybe a little bit more realistic. We gather the night before for a wake. Usually the wake would involve the body of the deceased having been cleaned up and laid out and would then involve telling stories and probably a good amount of drinking and that sort of thing in honor of, of the deceased. But the, the point is that the, the wake is actually, or the vigil is actually a home. The place of it is home, is the home. Uh, ideally, the place where the person dies is in their home. And ideally, uh, the preparation of the body for burial which would usually simply mean washing and dressing, not pumping all, not draining the blood and pumping all kinds of chemicals into them, um, and uh, a lot of cosmetics to uh, make them look good, so everybody will admire the. Uh, well, I won't go into that, uh, <laughs> but that. that that you know the, the the proper place to begin the way that we handle the the way that we um, treat the person who has died and deal with their remains the disposition shall we say of their remains has to begin with how we reverence the body in its preparation for burial and ideally the vigil really is the, the culmination of that. The family, members of the family prepare the person's body, uh, wash, dress, or put a shroud on it or something, and the body is lying there uh, covered. Uh, and we pray at home. And then there is the second part of it actually the transition between the first and second part is a procession and what's important here is that there are two processions in the whole process of the of the funeral liturgy first procession is from the home to the um to the church they come into the place where is the christian home of the Christian person who has just died. The place where that person, along with the whole Christian community, gathered to celebrate the presence of Christ in the Eucharist. So what more fitting way to have a final meal with the deceased than to bring them to our Christian home, the church, and celebrate the Eucharist with them. And in that Eucharist, we are praying for them. We are committing them uh, to the Lord. And that Eucharist concludes with, uh, with the ritual. It's a very brief ritual, but it's very poignant. The final commendation and farewell is what they call it, what we call it. Uh, it is an invitation to pray at the end of the Mass invitation to pray, singing a song of farewell. And within that song of farewell, ideally, uh, the celebrant incenses the remains, the earthly remains of the, of, of, of the deceased Christian, Re giving it a sign of reverence. Uh, the incense has kind of two, two meanings to it. One is that it is a sign of reverence for the uh, body of the deceased. 
uh, and the other is that it is a sign of our prayer rising to God for uh, for the deceased. Ideally, you know, what they often do is at that time sprinkle the body with holy water. Ideally, the holy water should come at the very beginning, just like our yes, tradition yes. of the asparagus of of the asparagus, or which you know kind of goes into the holy water font. You you are signed with the sign of the cross in. Uh, signing yourself with holy water when you enter. That's a recollection of baptism. So uh, the holy water comes at the beginning, at the end of the procession to the church, at the door of the church, welcoming the person remains, uh, recalling their baptism. And then they come in for the Eucharist and then... Uh, just the ritual. Sorry, Tom. Does the ritual describe that that the rite of sprinkling should come first in a funeral mass? And yes, the, it okay. does. Good. It does. Yeah. And uh, Kathy is saying goodbye to everyone. No. So uh, you got to you got to go to work. You got to check do. in. I do. Yeah. So, um, oh. But I I also asked a question about cremation. Okay. Uh, I'll get to cremation. I'll watch. Um, okay. If you want. Uh, I'm sure that. John and Jan will will also bring a cremation, okay. and that may be the final thing that we'll talk about. Okay, nice being okay. with you guys. Talk to you later. Nice to okay. see you. Bye, Bye Kathy. Thank, Thank you. you. Pray for your brother. Thank you. We will indeed. Uh, yeah, the ritual is very definite that that incense should be used at the, at the final commendation and farewell, and that the holy water would uh, uh, be at the entrance to the church makes a lot of sense that yeah. way. also the song of farewell which is um uh may the angels lead you into paradise mm -hmm. and and so on oh, is an integral part of the uh rite of commendation and farewell beautiful uh, yeah. mm -hmm. and then and then just a very brief concluding right. prayer uh commending the person to the lord and one, one very significant thing, which is often ignored, at the end of the funeral mass, there is no dismissal. Right. You know, there is a ritual at, at the end of every mass, the Lord be with you, the blessing, and then right. uh, go in peace. Uh, uh, there's no, uh, th there is no dismissal. Instead, the ritual says, now let us take the remains of our brother or sister uh, to their final resting place. I have another question for you, Tom. In the current liturgy, uh, is the final blessing over the congregation omitted? It should be. Because it used That's to be, often ignored. What well, used to be uh, not given in, in any, what we used to call a black mass, meaning if you're using black yeah. mass. Yeah, and I and I think I think that was the case too, and that's the reason because the the liturgy doesn't end there. Right. The next the next step of the liturgy is a procession to the place of burial. Mm -hmm. Now, in many you know uh, churches in the past, the place of burial was the churchyard. Yeah, so it would simply be a procession outside the church to the place of burial. Uh, which would be right outside the church. So procession everybody would enter into. Uh, these days, the procession is a, you know, a, it, it still is interesting because it is a, a procession through, yeah. through the city to, to the cemetery where everybody is you know, in their cars with their lights on and, uh, and the police are, or, uh motorcycle officers are are uh you know um uh protecting the procession from the usual rules actually of uh of, of traffic um so but the the movement is very very important the significance of the movement from mm -hmm. from the uh home to the church 
to the place of burial. And we've lost sight of that, I think, a lot. And yet, commending, you know, it, it concludes with the, with the analogy at, after that procession, the graveside service is not just more prayers for the deceased and, and uh, uh, that sort of thing. The, the, the graveside service basically centers on the actual lowering of the person into the ground, which of course is the um, uh, I guess what would be the word analog, uh, the reversal of birth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 the tomb, entering into the tomb is the reversal of the uh, uh, entering out of the womb. And, and that is the womb of eternity now. So uh, it, it finishes with the consignment of the earthly remains uh, to the elements from which it was made, from which our bodies are made, uh, in the sure and certain hope of resurrection, resurrection from the tomb. Um, just a little footnote too, you know, one of my favorite images, uh, icons, is of the Dormition of Mary, mm. in which Jesus is, uh, is seen next to the dead body at that point of his mother uh, stepping outside of the gates of heaven, holding her as an infant. Wow. That's nice. I've never seen that. That's nice. Uh, I'm sure you have. I, I don't. I know the term because that's Eastern. That's Eastern. Yeah, but, Catholic. but uh, I'm, I'm I'm sure that you've seen it. it it's it's probably you know that and the um, Anastasis, the the risen Christ raising um, Adam and Eve from their tombs mm. are mm. two of the most popular. Uh, iconic depiction great theology it's beautiful theology yeah you know one of the things i wanted to come back to tom i know our time is short but in terms of the three stages or or parts of the uh, roman catholic funeral liturgy the vigil or the wake it really in practical purposes in my uh, experience does not happen in the home anymore it happens no. in church and church being the home the the the, the liturgical or you know home of that person Right. Yeah. yeah. Now, I, I, I have I have some very definite countercultural feelings about that because um, where where it used to happen more frequently was in the funeral home. Mm -hmm. Okay. We've we've removed the preparation of the body from the home where the person lived into a commercial establishment. Um, uh, with, you know, a, a sort of a sanitation of death. Uh, we don't have to be involved with the, um, with dealing with the remains of the family member who has died. Uh, somebody comes and picks them up and then delivers them back in a hearse, but they often will have, uh, you know, a chapel or a room for, uh, for a service. Mm -hmm. And many non-Catholic services simply would take place in the funeral home and then go to burial. Uh, but what Catholics have tended to do is the night before gather there uh, uh, after the body has been prepared, laid in the coffin and all of that for the viewing and the rosary. Well, that really is better uh, better labeled the traditional label, the vigil. It's the remnant, I think, of our uh, tradition of, of um, wake, of holding vigil, of being awake with the, the body, uh, the remains of our loved one, uh, and 
Um, that really also is the time when, if we're going to have a memorial of the person's life, mm -hmm. yeah. looking backwards, right. right? That's the time to do that. That's the time for the eulogies, not during the mass. That's the time for the right. eulogies. That's the time for sitting around and telling stories and remembering, right? And uh, using certain aids to telling stories, certain liquid yeah. aids to uh, assist yeah, right. us to yeah. more freely um, uh, tell and enjoy the stories looking to the past. That you know, that's the time for that, not. And that's probably the time for playing music that the person loved and all of that. Yeah. But uh, you know, you the the whole focus once you have moved from the home to the church, we're no longer looking backward; we're looking forward. Yeah, that's a good part of the theology. Yeah, you know that was expressed in that. Uh, I don't know about how your your funeral masses go, but in ours, we have properly provided and a lot of Episcopal priests don't do it right but we pro properly provided for the reading of of the gospel and the preaching on that particular gospel and we're limited to x number of gospels that can be chosen um i still choose the the martha and you know lazarus thing I, that's my mm -hmm. favorite but you know and then there's a homily which should not be a eulogy Oftentimes, right. priests go off on left field on this, at least Episcopal priests. Anyway, but there is a place in that in that liturgical uh, design for the eulogies, but they're distinct from the preaching of the word. They yeah. should not be blended. But do you allow that at all? In yes. The, the yeah, and, uh, and and that is following the prayer after communion, which. Right concludes the communion rite. Right. It's Never before, before yeah. the prayer, but right. following the prayer after communion. Yeah. And then uh, uh, the, the liturgical books called, uh, call the eulogy words of remembrance. Right, right. But if there are to be brief words of remembrance, that's the appropriate time. And yeah, then we go into the um, uh, rite of commendation and right, farewell. Right. Yeah, we do that too. But it's interesting. Um, when when I was pastor of parishes, I would never allow open mic. You know, some priests do this. You know, anybody can get up and say something. That was that was nuts because that could make the mass mm -hmm. go on for centuries. You know, I you know, limited to like three, and they had X number of minutes, and it was all rehearsed and designed. And you know, and they would get up there, and and that otherwise the whole time frame of the liturgy gets. You know, yeah, yeah, and, and that's that's always problematic too. Um, and I've done both, but usually I'll you know talk with the family about limiting the limiting the time. I, I wish we had time to talk about the Ars Moriendi thing that you'd put in your uh, uh, points to be discussed, but maybe we don't have time today for that. But that was fabulously interesting. That whole whole concept of the why the yeah. Ars Moriendi is important today as, as it was in the 15th century. Yeah, and, and I think we, you know, the, the whole on death and dying sort of thing, the, you know, the, the movement that was started by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, right. you know, I, I think is really important for us to take kind of seriously, okay, um, it is an important part of life to come to terms with our mortality. And there are stages for doing that. And uh, we're not doing anybody a favor by trying to hide the fact of mortality from them when they're dying. Uh, but we have to be a little bit careful. You know, the bedside, the, the lack of bedside manner of some physicians is, is pretty horrendous there too. Uh, and I won't go into that, but the, the guys slept through that when they're in medical school and they taught bedside manner. Well, yeah, or maybe there, or, or maybe there was a, an elective in medical school, one side being uh, patient care and the other yeah. side being, uh, uh, the financial, aspect of it. I don't, I don't know, but I, yeah, I, I really don't want to. Well done, Tom. Well I don't done. want to get into that. 
before we go, there is the question of cremation. And in, uh, the, the Catholic Church has been very, very strong in condemning cremation up until, let's say, the Second Vatican Council. What was the magic that turned our attitude to a very permissive and accepting uh, uh, of cremation, even if I think rightly we say, you know, the, the better symbol of resurrection is to place the uh, remains of the deceased in the ground. Um, it has been pointed out that the problem with placing the remains of the deceased in the ground is what you're placing in the ground is a skin-shaped bag of chemicals that have been shot into the person <laughs> and cosmetics rather than you know their natural remains. So one of our problems is that we we our funeral industry has tended to sort of uh, create an artificial construct around the remains so that we don't have a nat natural, natural burial. Uh, and that, of course, isn't, isn't always the case, but all too often. Uh, but what about, well, what about cremation? Since the Enlightenment, uh, one of the things that secularists and anti-religion people and anti-Catholics and in particular Masons have used to uh, personally deny the faith in the resurrection was to say, well, I'm going to be cremated and therefore there won't be anything to raise. Uh, so that's my way of showing that it's, you know, this whole idea is, is crazy. And I think to whatever extent that may or may not be true of, uh, of, of Masonic practices and beliefs, this was something I think that the church um, very strongly uh, uh, reacted against and said, uh, Catholics may not be Masons and Catholics may not be cremated because that is buying into the Masonic belief mm. or denial of, of the resurrection. That's interesting. I'd never heard that. Yeah. And, and, I've never heard that either. That's, yeah. And, and I think, I think that's a big yeah. part of the, of the strength of the prohibition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, looking into behind that is the fact that um, cremation has never been part of the Western European tradition. You know, it, it's an essential in the Indian Hindu tradition. But, you know, in fact, the, the COVID crisis, you know, uh, really uh, created a crisis for uh, Hindu burial in, uh, or cremation in, in, in India, uh, which I hope they have resolved by this time, but you know, that can even be a you know, lead to a shortage of trees, deforestation, and so on. Right. But right. Uh, cremation has never been a part. You know, it, it simply wasn't considered for the first three quarters or more of our um, Christian tradition. Now we're it's having it. to deal with it from several points of view. One of which is uh, even ecologically running out of burial space. Yeah. It's interesting, uh, in, in Hawaii, you know, in the Diocese of Honolulu, uh, they had a special indult uh, way before the council, you know, that they would, they would have cremation as the norm, because in the tropics, I mean, you know, bodies simply don't last, even if they're embalmed. Yeah. So yeah. It, that, was, that was never a problem 
for Roman Catholics in that in that region and probably in the other, you know, Guam and other places. I, I would think there, yeah. And 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 what that means is it's probably more culturally determined than yeah. it is yeah. religiously determined. And now you have the fact that um, economics has to enter into it. Right, right. Well, it's, it's interesting because when I was in India um, before COVID and we took a ride up the Ganges, I mean, you know, all of the Ghats in Varanasi, you know, there's this one huge Ghat where they do all the cremations and it was, you know, it drove you home to see all that wood and, you know, and the, and the people just out there like every day, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's people. So, you know, things like that were overrun during COVID that really made it, you know, almost impossible for people to be able to do those rituals. So mm -hmm. it's interesting to see that contrast between how, you know, like, as you said, Tom, Western Europe looks at it so differently than, than the Hindu. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So officially now, the uh, the uh, the ritual book, the Order of Christian Funerals, does have an appendix on on cremation with a very uh, you know and it's kind of encouraging, not not encour you know, basically saying that that intact burial is the preferred norm, but uh, cremation for whatever reason is, uh, is, is, is acknowledged as one of the legitimate possibilities. Uh, the one thing that they do say, however, is that the cremated remains uh, should be uh, placed in a, uh, in a burial setting. You know, in 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 the cemetery, uh, rather than scattered or um, mm. uh, permanent re permanently reside on top of the television or the mantle or something like that. What about at sea burials? Do they do they uh, permit the ashes to be um, to be brought to sea? No. Oh, really? That's no. very common. Of course, that may be a Hawaii thing again, too. Yeah. Well, uh, let's let's put it this way: it it is not. It is not permitted, but I would say for the most part, it's not enforced. Mm. You know, I, I myself have participated in some um, um, sea burials of, of ashes. And um, I, I can't say that that is, is my preferred thing, but I, I could see that it was... Uh, uh, you know, there was a reason for doing that. So, any parting, parting shots? We are now 10 o'clock, one hour. Shall we bid adieu to the, uh, to our friends on Facebook? And, uh, there are still eight people with us on Facebook. Wow. God bless you. God, God bless you all. And uh, let's simply conclude with a moment of prayer uh, for all of those who have gone before us, uh, especially members of our families and friends. Uh, Janice, could you tell us a little bit before we pray, could you tell us a little bit about what you about your background picture? Sure. Okay. So I, you know, I've been going to Holy Name of Mary, you know, just recently. And when I went on Sunday and walked in, of course, because it was Halloween, um, this is how they decorated for um, all of the people who had died during the year. And I just thought it was lovely. It was like a string of all these crosses with the names that really encircled the entire, uh, around the al around the altar well outside of all of the pews so in a way they were surrounding us which I find really mm -hmm. interesting and then the pictures also they had pictures on the altar of everybody which is mm -hmm. you know kind of normal and I mean in contrast to um, you know Good Shepherd where they do these banners along the 
you know, it's a little different. So mm -hmm. every church does it differently, but I, I really like this. And I thought, oh, I, I, you know, wanted to take a picture because I think it was just really beautiful. Mm -hmm. I notice behind you to your left, our right, is Father Pat O'Hagan. Yeah. And um, I, I, don't, I don't think I realized that he had died. I, so, wow, I can't believe you can read that. <laughs> well, I, I can't can read really it, read too. any of the others, but I do see, see his name. I okay. also see that he was Father Damien's order. SSVC, right. the right. Sacred Hearts of Mary and Jesus. Yeah. The wonderful that, order, wonderful order. That, that's, that's the order that runs Holy Name of Mary. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. And in the same neighborhood as Holy Name of Mary, a couple of blocks away is Damien High School. Right. Ah, right. I see. And, and they, uh, they run Damien uh, High School also. There's wonderful nuns and, and priests and brothers of that order in uh, yeah. Hawaii, a lot of them in Hawaii when I was yeah. there. Yeah. Interesting. Now, the pastor at this parish, he gave a really beautiful homily. I mean, he's really good. I really like what he has to say. So, mm -hmm. so I've, been, I've been coming, you know, to Holy Name now in the last few weeks because it's more enriching. Mm hmm Well, let us, uh, let us then simply commend all of the we are being, we are surrounded by a huge cloud of witnesses yes uh, amen who amen. sometimes in their all too obvious imperfection are also a sign of grace to us so we simply commend them to you to your love and mercy lord receive them into the fullness of your of your kingdom of your presence of your loving embrace and help us to run eagerly to join them, to see our joining of all of your saints into one kingdom, into one reign, into one eternal community, into one eternal family with you. Help us to keep that in mind as the, as the goal of our lives. We make this prayer in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. Amen. And may the Lord bless us and keep us and let his face shine on us. Give us his peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 So God bless you all on Facebook and uh, look forward to seeing you next week. I'm hoping next week we can talk a little bit about the Eucharist. That's going to be That's a wonderful. very, yeah. very alive uh, topic in in our world and in our church over this these coming weeks mm -hmm. so bye bye now god bless you bye. and here bye. stop the live stream bye.